Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Monero Space interview. Today, you have Justin and Sarang on with Dave Jevons, who is the CEO of CypherTrace. There was recent uh, news that came out with a recent announcement that they put together that said that CypherTrace is now offering some sort of Monero tracing tools to some of its VASPs and government customers. And so we're here today to help learn a little bit more about what types of services they're providing and to get a little bit extra clarity on that end. But before we do that, uh, I want to address the elephant in the room, of course, because here you have on one end a cipher trace, which sells blockchain analysis software. And then, then on the other hand, you have Sarang Nother, who is a researcher that works on Monero, which specifically tries to make software that is resilient to blockchain analysis software. So wanted to get that out there, you know, right off the bat, that there is a bit of an elephant in the room from that perspective. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we can't have good conversations here about uh, what CypherTrace is doing, because ultimately it seems like the two people, two other people on the call are very focused on sort of the same thing here, making sure that uh, we have good tests to determine whether or not uh, Monero is resilient against these sorts of attacks. Um, but first, uh, Dave, I want to give you an a chance to introduce yourself and CypherTrace. Uh, can you let us all know what... Uh, what you're, you've been, uh, what Cypher Trace is and what you do? Sure. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Frank. Uh, Cypher Trace is a company focused on blockchain analytics. We work with three different uh, types of customers. One are cryptocurrency exchanges that need to do investigations if their customers' funds get stolen. They also need to perform anti-money laundering duties, so assessing the risk of transactions when money comes in or out of the exchange across over 800 currencies we support. Second user group are law enforcement and regulators. So these are folks who work on criminal cases involving cryptocurrencies and try to figure out where the money went and um, how to stop criminal terrorists and other types of um, of activities. And the third group are financial institutions, so primarily banks, and we help them to monitor cryptocurrencies and also to assess companies when they want to provide banking relationships so they can look at an exchange and say, your you know, overall transactions look good, your KYC looks good. Yes, we'd like to take you on as a banking customer. Very nice. Sarang, would you like to give a brief introduction on your background, too, and what you do with the Monero Research Lab? Uh, sure. So I am uh, Dr. Sarang Noether, and I am a research contributor to the Monero Research Lab workgroup, um, which is one of the research and development workgroups um, that contributes uh, work, research, development to the Monero Open Source Project. Um, it's not the only one, um, but I've been working for a few years on just kind of general open privacy research. Um, you can see a lot of the work that's done um, at getmonero.org on the research lab page. Um, we have been doing a lot of work on uh, protocol design, algorithm design, um, chain analysis, and similar things. So um, we end up publishing a lot of work on chain analysis and a lot of, of kind of other work um, for outreach, for example, the Breaking Monero series that talks about some of the limitations of privacy-focused protocols and how they might impact users. Very nice. Um, I also want to start with this other uh, disclaimer away or other statement that, you know, Monero is an open permissionless network. So ultimately, we obviously are assuming that people are going to be looking at data that is pu stored publicly for the whole world to see. We're not delusional and say that people will ignore this public data. So Monero research in mind has or has kept in mind that people will at some point look at this information. So we aren't especially surprised that companies like Safe for Trace are looking at this blockchain data. And for that, in fact, the Monero Research Lab was really the first to look at this data like back in 2014 to make some recommendations on its ring size, or at least the first that we know of, right? I'm sure someone else probably looked at it of it like day one, right? Um, yeah, I mean, there, there, it's 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 definitely worth saying that you know researchers, um, both from within the Monero communities and other academic and industry researchers, have for years and years. I mean, since the uh, the asset was released and kind of started becoming popular, have been doing a ton of different analysis on the blockchain and on the protocol in an attempt to identify weaknesses and determine how to make it better and safer for users. So. Um, and of course, the information that's agree, like an, an adversarial development and threat model always assumes um, that different entities, um, whether they're on your side or not on your side, whatever that means, um, are doing all that they can to perform analysis using public and non-public data. 
Yes, exactly. And then plus a transaction you made four years ago is still going to be public on the blockchain today, right? So forever in the future. So uh, the point of this interview, though, is, is on CypherTrace, just because they announced that they are uh, now offering a version one of their tool to the public. And so really the point of this interview is to help uh, learn more specifically about what the CypherTrace tool does, what it offers to you know, law enforcement, perhaps other vast uh, virtual asset service providers and other customers that they wish to engage with. So Dave, starting with that, can you talk about the background for this tool? Uh, I believe it started as a Department of Homeland Security's contract. So can you talk about what is public with relation to the contract and the original motivations for working on this tool? Yeah, so Justin, the uh, you're correct. The initial uh, motivation for working on the Monero uh, cryptocurrency was um, a Department of Homeland Security Science and Technology Directorate uh, contract to do exactly that, to look at privacy-oriented coins, and in specific, in this case, it was Monero. And the goal of that research was to provide tools for investigators of financial crimes to help assist in their investigations. So being able to trace funds flow, being able to um, follow the money, re reduce false positives, and um, eventually enable investigators to, um, you know, to do the other work that they do, which are subpoenas and MLATs and the other stuff around finding who's on the other side of transactions for criminal activity. Understood. Cool. And I guess on a high level, before we get into any specifics, can you talk uh, about uh, what specifically the, the tool can do right now on a, on a high level? Sure. So as we mentioned, it's a version one of the tool. There's you know, there's a roadmap of lots of things to do, but the tool um, does give you visual exploration. It does decoy elimination. It does probability scoring of inputs and outputs of transactions, allows you to um, assign risk to different um, addresses and uh, allows you to do case management of those addresses. Okay, cool. um, just um, just to be clear, Dave, when you say addresses, are you referring to wallet addresses or one-time addresses that appear on the blockchain? Um, and the Monero protocol, as you obviously know, but maybe the listeners don't, um, those things are are mathematically differentiated in a big way, where um, without external information, sometimes significant external information, one-time output addresses that appear on the blockchain are not um, inherently linkable to any wallet address. So which do you mean when you say that? Yeah, wallet addresses. So yeah, that's correct. One-time use addresses are generally not linkable. I mean, the same is true on, to some extent, on Bitcoin, unless somebody's actually sent money to it. It's obviously more sophisticated on Monero. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think Dave I'm sure, we, I'm sure, I'm sure we will ask later about how you claim this, but I won't, I won't ask that right now. I just wanted to differentiate. Sure. So, so I guess, of course, remember that I'm the CEO and not the head of the, uh, the of the analysis team. So I can only represent, uh, you know, the analysis team, but I'll do my best. And we don't want to obviously share every everything that we're doing and how we do it, but we'll do our best to tell you what we can. Uh, so on, on Reddit, there is a, an account. I want to confirm it's yours before we proceed with this. But there was an account that shared an example transaction graph for Monero. Can you confirm, first of all, that this was you that shared it? Well, I haven't seen it, but I did share one graph, yeah. Okay, okay, cool. So can I... Um, I'm going to screen share this really quick just so that hopefully, I mean, hopefully the screen share works. Okay. I just missed it. I did not give it the permission. So without reloading the page, I cannot share the, the screen, but can, um, there was a, a shared transaction graph. And I think that, uh, Serang Notha really wanted to go through this graph, uh, just to see, um, or, or I guess some, ask some questions to see a little bit of additional context, uh, surrounding what, uh, the, the tool does. Uh, so Serang, can you start mm -hmm. asking some questions on the, uh, on what was shown in the, the transaction graph? Sure, so I mean, I, I think it's important to differentiate between the specific example that, um, that you shared to r slash Monero on Reddit um, and what, what might be considered to be um, just a more general transaction that you, know, you might be handed by a client or a customer. So from this particular graph, um, it appears that this is simply a merge analysis where for example, um, a Monero transaction might spend multiple previous transaction outputs 
each of which is associated with a non-interactively signed ring that contains a bunch of other decoys. Um, and one type of analysis says, well, if I have a, a, a suspicion that two previous transaction outputs were directed to the same entity, later on, depending on how the user decides to act, they might spend a transaction that includes one of those outputs in one ring and another one of those outputs in another ring, but both of which are associated to a single transaction. And from there, you might assign a certain statistical likelihood that those are in fact the true signers um, among those particular rings. Is that what this is showing? Is that a correct assessment of what's being done here, Dave? You're a little too deep in the tech for me on that one. Okay, um, I, 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 will, I will continue to push you on this or I will push you to push me to someone else on this because I think this is an extremely important question. <laughs> yeah, sure. um, and, and the reason I ask this is um, because there have been, there's been a lot of research over many years about different heuristics that can be done. Um, you know, some, some ways you can try to identify spent outputs are absolutely definitive. For example, um, many old outputs on the Monero chain, you can use very simple set theoretic analysis to say, I can absolutely confirm that this one-time address was the signer of this particular transaction. I can send you tools that build this list in just a few hours off of the chain. Um, and there's other methods you can use, like what I'm describing now, this merge analysis, that are heuristic, they're statistical. Um, you can argue whether or not it's likely or unlikely that different transactions might include certain previous outputs and rings or, or not include them. And you might be able to base some statistics on this. But I think it's really important to differentiate what methods are claimed to be used. Um, so maybe instead of asking Everything that question. Yeah, so it's, a, it's not a heuristical model. So we use the heuristic models that we've seen in every piece of published research as well as a number of the different statistical models. We utilize our own statistical model uh, to do this. We use the previously public research to um, develop kind of a skeleton, if you will, framework for um, improving the accuracy of the heuristical search models. And so using probabilistic models, we're able to trim down the search tree dramatically um, so yes, we use all of the pub published research that we've seen, and this kind of gives us that those hints and those ways to um, to reduce the search tree. And then it is all probabilistic search. Okay, so just just to make sure, you kind of cut out just a little bit, but you are saying that this is still heuristic. This is not, um, I don't know, deterministic, definitive, for example. I mean, there's there's a big difference between those. It is not, it's not like Bitcoin where you can do 100% deterministic saying, yes, I know 100%, this is the person it is. It is, uh, it is statistical probability modeling. Okay, um, so I guess I am looking so on I, my we, other- We basically take, any, we take anything over 90% as being statistically meaningful and How do you, present um, what, what metrics to the user. What methods or metrics do you use to assess that? So you say so the you, say way that you we have a, a threshold. So I mean, what, what methods should I, I mean, for example, I'm looking at the, the example on my other screen here that you had posted to r slash Monero. Um, and we see on the left-hand side of this example, you know, presumably a bunch of old transaction outputs, some of which, if we're reading this right, which there's not a lot of details, um, appear to be kind of being pulled into addition on other transaction inputs, which is what led me to believe this is uh, some kind of merge analysis. Um, but if I'm looking at this example, um, what methods might I be uh, interested in, in seeing um, that you might use to develop some single numerical model to determine you know, whether or not this is above or below 90%, like you had said? Yeah, I'm going to pass on that since I'm not the math guy. But OK. Um, um, yeah. OK, I, I, I will the, say that almost, problem, almost yeah. all of the questions that I was planning to ask in this interview basically were, what is the math behind this? Um, I, I get what you're saying about trying to pull together different statistics yeah. and heuristics. Um, however, like the, uh, the details behind that are, are by no means uh, unimportant here. You know, namely, um, a lot of the no, research I, that we do, and that's been done for years on this already, and that continues to be done, basically highlights that it is, I would say, not possible to, uh, to build a single number um, that, that surrounds the likelihood of something being a true signer in a particular transaction. All this depends on the metrics you're using. Um, and at least from what I know, from having studied this for a long, long time, saying that this is a 90% or not 90% likelihood of signing um, depends entirely on the metrics you're using. Those are very subjective. So any details you can provide would be uh, insightful. 
Sure. Yeah. And I'll, I'll talk to our team about that and we can have another conversation or an email conversation around that. That wasn't on the list of things that I was expecting we would talk about today. Otherwise, I'd have brought somebody else on the conversation. Um, okay. You know, our experience on it is that looking at all of the published research, um, there are hints to and they're, they're, they, they are helpful in guiding the uh, probabilistic analysis but we haven't seen anything that does it the way that we're doing. We're also, of course, as you can appreciate, um, analyzing the entire history of Monero transactions. And I think a number of the approaches have suggested that doing that is um, mathematically or computationally infeasible, but there are definitely optimization algorithms to, to make that more, po more possible. But again, I'm not the math guy. So, so before you before you ask another question, Serang, I, I have one in relation to the I guess 90 percent threshold that gets returned. So, uh, I, I guess first of all, how did you come to to this ninety percent number? Why why ninety percent? Arbitrary. We figure if you give uh, if you give an investigator a ninety percent probability, that's pretty good. I think you know. Would it be nice to get better? Yes. So, for example. As we add things like minor uh, monitoring mining pools and some of the things like that, then you can you can refine the number down from ninety to be or rather up from ninety to be higher probability. So all of those different models give you a little bit more edge. As you you know, you'll never get to one hundred percent of Monero. It's I don't know if it's impossible, but it's extremely computationally unlikely. Um, but we chose 90% as being a threshold, which helps people in their investigations to, uh, to, to build out multiple maps of where the money has moved or may have moved. Um, so it's just an arbitrary decision based on what investigators, you know, what will be useful for them. Okay, and one more interpretive question on that. When you say 90%, is that typically in the context that there's a 90% chance that it came from let's say an ident a specific identified source for, for example, in the use of a compliance program where you would feel like, oh, well, a certain threshold that it had, th there's a likelihood that it came from, let's say an unwanted darknet market purchase, or is it like a 90% threshold in terms of, uh, let's say the context where uh, a specific uh, output may end up with a certain set of users or these sort of uh, outputs would have been merged Unlikely by chance, and I guess there's there, I guess there's so many different types of tests that we can use. It's it's hard for me to know how to interpret that. Yeah, it, it, it's much more on the mathematical side around this is our 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 likelihood that it came from these addresses to these addresses. Now, when you tag addresses or wallets, and you start saying, well, then you cluster wallets again together. So that's another level of saying all these are controlled by the same entity whether it's a dark net market or a person, then you get another type of, of score on top of it. So you combine the mathematical score with um, temporal analysis across other evidence factors, which are off chain. Sure. So um, in, in particular, the example that we were uh, discussing before that you had posted to r slash Monero, um, I'd asked a few questions about it that you didn't feel comfortable uh, answering at the time. I guess, could you walk me through what I should gain from looking at that particular example? Yeah, I think the only thing to gain from that is we saw people saying on Reddit that, um, oh, without pictures, this is just a bunch of fear, uncertainty, doubt, FUD stuff, and they haven't done anything. So we didn't, we didn't position it as, here's how it works, here's how you do a technical analysis of it. That's not our, our point in doing that. It's, here's what you've got here, which is you've got um, you've got decoy input discrimination that we believe is close to 100%. And you've got um, visual exploration and you've got the ability to tag wallets and uh, do forward and backward tracing on it. So that is the that was the only intent of that. It was not intended to be a technically you know, a technical document that said, here's how everything is working. As you can understand, CypherTrace is a commercial entity and um, we want to help the Monero community make the product better. 
but we also have a you know a a, a requirement to service our customers. So from this, should I assume that by um, I mean when when I originally looked at this, you know, having no information from anyone else, um, I guess I looked at this as saying, well, okay, you know, you can certainly um, if you happen to um, no particular transactions are associated with certain types of activity. You can obviously flag their outputs. It's just like you could with any other asset. Um, then you can look at transactions that take those um, those previous outputs, and include them as rings, um, and those outputs may or may not be the actual signers. Um, and then maybe you could try to assign some risk score risk score using some kind of output merging or or some other techniques. Um, so I guess in are you are you willing to or able to say? Um, to what extent you're able to use witness indistinguishable ring signatures to try to gain probabilities. So as an example, um, I might have a transaction that spends exactly one input and has the ring size of 11, which means that one of the 11 uh, previously used transaction outputs are going to be the signer there. And maybe one of those outputs has been flagged uh, previously as part of some illicit activity, who knows. Um, and in that case, without external information, the most that you can say mathematically is that, I don't know, there's a one in 10 chance that you know, this transaction um, could be spending you know, illicit funds. Is this an accurate way to describe how you might view that probability? I think it's an accurate way to describe how you, how you do it. I mean, again, I'm not the math guy, but um, it's, it's a gen in general, yes, it's a probabilistic model. And obviously, you know, the number of rings matters. Prob probability goes down. But you also have to understand that you can map many other factors into the analysis that aren't just on chain. Which, which is certainly true. Um, but I guess the, the one kind of key difference between something like um, even like Bitcoin with a, a coin join type, op type operation um, is that in a coin join operation, every single input definitively signed in that transaction. So it's a fully interactive process. There's oh, yeah. no deniability in that case. Whereas yeah, a Monero joins, ring signature is deniable. Which, is easy. Well, right, right. But I guess I guess I want to ensure that I understand the fact that like if I have a transaction that is completely benign and is uninteresting at all to any investigator for whatever reason, um, the protocol may choose you know one or more outputs that came from illicit transactions as ring members, and I had absolutely nothing to do with that. So you know my transaction could get flagged. Is that true? Risk propagation is not that simple. So risk propagation is a much more nuanced uh, discussion. Um, you clearly want to avoid tainted coins, or as we call them. Um, you don't taint analysis is very challenging issue here because um, you've really got both sides of this problem. So the false pro positive problem that you posit is absolutely one that we want to avoid because it doesn't help anyone. So is the false negative problem, which is transactions propagated through multiple parties that are trying to obfuscate their activities. So it's a very challenging research area. Um, there's no you know, solid answer to this. So some people will say, how deep do you go? What about in this case in Monero? What about mixing in innocent transactions versus non-innocent? This gets back to historical analysis. So it is a you know, you hit you hit on a very important issue here, um, and and a non-trivial one. The other thing I would point out about this um, th this particular question is, to be honest, there's no one answer. It comes down to what is the country and the jurisdiction that you're in, but also more importantly, who is the customer. So some people have a very low risk tolerance and want to see everything. Others only want to see really bad stuff. So sanctioned transactions, terrorist transactions, et cetera. And so it has to be configurable per user, per customer, per jurisdiction. And this, of course, as you'll appreciate, creates huge complexities in computational uh, power required as well as storage, because you're talking about if you want to deliver it in real time, uh, multiple different risk scores across a huge graph database and huge data lake. But just to be absolutely clear, so if we have one transaction you know, that is uh, not otherwise illicit, that includes uh, no tainted outputs in its rings, and we have another transaction that includes one or possibly more tainted outputs in its rings, again, both transactions are benign, 
um, it is safe to say that the latter would have a higher risk score than the former, even though they're both non-interactive processes choosing those ring members. That's, that's generally correct, yeah. Okay, thank you. We, yeah, we, t yeah, we tend to, err so again, risk scoring is a whole other discussion. So we tend to err on the conservative side of risk scoring, which is if you are, have direct uh, transactions with a known bad entity, then you're going to get a high one, but the farther it goes down, you will not. Right. I guess, I guess I'm just trying to be exceptionally clear about the fact that decoy selection is non-interactive. Yeah. So, so, so for example, when you say transactions with, it sounds like you are, you are, uh, you're referring to happening to select an output that is somehow viewed as tainted by your protocol or process. C correct. So yeah, generally mixed in transactions will bring in some amount of risk into them, but. And I also do want to clarify when you, you say mixed you in, you are not referring to interactive mixing. You are referring to decoy selection, which is part of the Monero protocol. This is, is correct. Right? Okay, I just want to be really clear yes. about the use of the word mixing correct. and mix-ins because they yeah. are widely misunderstood. Yeah. Okay, cool. I think um, I think we can move on to talk about uh, how you may uh, identify a specific output as either higher risk or at the other side of the spectrum, one that you do have insight over, for example, a public a mining pool output that a mining pool may publicly declare that this is a Coinbase output that they mine. And therefore, uh, if a user attempts to spend it and you know that that transaction was not created by the mining pool, you may say, OK, well, that's a non-convincing uh, uh, decoy included in this in this transaction. So can you talk a little bit about some type of examples or, or some type of ways that you obtain information uh, outside of the blockchain to help I, you know, identify these outputs as either high risk or like as associated with a specific activity or a uh, low risk or specifically associated to an exchange or, or, or mining pool or something else like that. Sure. So there's a lot of different techniques involved uh, that are, you know, really all off chain. So certainly identifying mining pools is one identifying Cryptocurrency exchanges is another. There's a lot of techniques that go into doing that. Some do it voluntarily, most do not. So that's a whole art into itself. Uh, taking reports from people who've had their Monero stolen, uh, looking at reports from law enforcement, others on ransomware or other uh, cases that involve uh, stolen cryptocurrency or uh, illicitly gained cryptocurrency. So there's a, there's a whole suite of places where you get this information and you then you have to vet all of it. So we have a team that performs a vetting of information. So we don't, anything that's flagged as, as negative, we don't just automatically flag it as negative. There's human beings who go look at it and look at the source of it, verify the source of that information, and then input it into the system. So we will only flag things as being risky or criminal if we actually are able to verify it and verify the source of that information. So CypherTrace doesn't go scrape the internet and look for everything on Twitter and Reddit and other places and say, oh, that looks bad and put it in, everything is, as a source metric, is hand vetted by a team of experts that will go through and look at the source where it came from. And then this starts giving you reliable tagging information around what's dangerous, what's bad, what's sanctioned, what was stolen. Then we also have the ability to look at various dark markets and others and look at their transaction patterns, IP collection information, and look at IP addresses. This helps you get triangulation on them as well. Okay. Does CypherTrace, does CypherTrace itself perform any on-chain transactions as part of this uh, tracking process? We do. Anything else you can you can or care to share about this? 
Yeah. So on Monero, we don't do a lot about it. On other chains, we've done quite significant amounts of it. Um, on Monero in version one, we're not doing a lot of it. We do some. Um, there are quite a lot of, as I mentioned, you know, this is version one. There's a lot of other things to be developed um, in this area over the things that we've learned over the last 12 to 14 months. Um, so yes, as you as you can imagine, performing on-chain transactions in a variety of different ways have um, you know open up different threat models to Monero and every okay. other chain, but certainly okay, yeah, yeah. But yeah. but and, um, and, um, and to ensure the right definition, you yeah. do mean that you do mean that um, if, for example, you're looking at a particular entity's transaction, CipherTrace may make um, a transaction to that entity. On a particular chain, is that right? Like, for example, we, if you wanted we, to learn about, like, a, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Justin. Like I was saying, for example, like if there was a specific darknet market that you wanted to learn more about, and they had uh, a known deposit address, you, would you make transactions to this uh, to this address and then try and see uh, where you know some you know, try and see what other transactions they may be spent in? Yes. Okay, uh, um, and I'm, I assume that you know if one of your analysis partners, um, whether it be an exchange or a law enforcement agency, were to do the same thing, that they might provide such information to you to also be used in your analysis. So generally, not. You'd be surprised how private the industry is. Um, people are pretty protective of their information. There's not that much information sharing that goes on. Certainly some customers might share information or you'll get law enforcement agencies that want to make sure that everyone's protected from certain addresses or that, it, or there's also private sharing groups, as I'm sure you guys are aware of, that um, are active all the time that are sharing information about stolen uh, cryptocurrencies. And so, you know, real time being able to track that stuff, lock it down, black it, blacklist it, or, you know, block list it uh, uh, across exchanges is important to help protect people who've had funds that are stolen. Can you say whether or not a, uh, a Monero related VASP has provided information to you on any of the outputs that they control? I can't comment on that. Yes or no. I, I to be honest, I don't know. Okay. Um, do you? Um, so guess, you we do. Just to be clear, we don't. We do not solicit information from our VASP customers, and we specifically CipherTrace specifically says that we will not track any of your queries or uh, customer information. So we don't. By default, we do not track any of that. Um, it is possible that somebody could have submitted that information. We do have the ability for VASPs and um, other customers to submit information to us that goes into the analysis algorithms. It goes, gets filtered through humans and then goes into analysis algorithms once we verify the veracity of the information. Um, so to that extent, I can't, I can't say w whether we've done it or not because I don't know. Um, but in general, we do not. Uh, monitor people's uh, transaction analysis or their anti-money laundering, their financial investigation searches at all. I can at least t attest to the fact that many VASPs do not want to share that information with blockchain analytics companies. Uh, so I know it's often the case Absolutely. that people and, assume and, it's and shared. And it's fine but... that they shouldn't. You know, that's, yeah, I mean, that's our default is we don't do it. And right now we don't even have a policy for asking you if we can do it. So our, our methodology is we just don't do that. So I guess one question I had, so, um, you know, uh, considering, for example, the example that you had posted on uh, r slash Monero was, you know, maybe a particular transaction related to some particular example investigation. Um, so uh, to what extent would you consider the results that your tool can provide? Um, to what extent would you consider them to be generalizable broadly to modern transactions. Um, so, you know, we, we know and we have posted entire video series and papers about conditions and circumstances under which you can use Monero, like any tool, poorly. 
And you know, I can imagine that in such instances, you might be able to provide a lot more information and that this could be enhanced by having additional information from uh, law enforcement partners or other exchanges or controlled purchases you make or by other sources. To what extent would you consider that to be generalizable if you were handed just some arbitrary modern transaction? You know, could you provide less information than you typically would or that you had shown in your example uh, more, or is it pretty, pretty static across the board given what you can do? Well, no, I would say that if you are an extremely privacy focused uh, individual, you can always have what we call better OPSEC. So how about, uh, of, how about typical of OPSEC? Things are, mm, you know, so again, I just I just happen to hand you any random transaction on the modern Monero blockchain that happened yesterday. Uh, we would have pretty good visibility into it using this methodology. Okay. Um, can now, you say? Um, so I mean, when you say visibility, um, can you describe what you mean by visibility? Are you referring to being able to say this is well, the address the ability, that it's related to? to yeah, the address that it's related to, or highly probabilistically related to. Um, taking out all of the decoys, giving you that ability to uh, to trace the flows through it. Now, there's a lot more that can be done. And, you know, as we've talked about, so uh, some of that can be protected through OPSEC. So I would suggest that Monero users think about uh, strong OPSEC um, because there are many, many of them other do. ways to, you know. Well, I know many of them do and they should. Um, right. Yeah. Um, so I guess um, if I could just address two aspects of this, one of which you said is being able to link to wallet addresses, and the other of which is to be able to trace funds. And I consider those to be two very different problems. Um, so for example, um, removing decoys, um, which you talk about, could mean many different things. And in theory, could allow you to basically build a deterministic transaction graph relative to a certain transaction. Um, is there anything you can or will say about the nature of removing such decoys? So for example, you can deterministically do this to a huge degree with old Monero transactions, um, just based on some simple set theory that's been known for a long time. Is there anything you'd care to talk about for uh, this removal of decoys process for modern transactions? Uh, right now, I, I prefer not to mm -hmm. say that, just that every piece of work that we have seen that's been published uh, is an input into our research. We have not seen anyone approach it in the way that we've been doing it. Okay. Um, and again, it's a prob it's, it, it, it's not a deterministic model. It's a probability model. So we, as we talked about earlier, we define probabilities over 90% as something that you should go look at as an investigator. Um, so, you know, anything in 10, 5, 9%, what have you, 7%, 0.01%, we don't surface that to you. We give you the high probabilities. Um, yeah. um, and so I guess the second part of that would be you talked about linking back to wallet addresses, which I should say absent external information mm -hmm. is not mathematically possible. So, um, you know, if a user is interacted with an exchange or another entity that happens to know their address, you know, you can imagine, and we've talked in previous episodes of Breaking Monero, about ways in this which link this linking could happen. Um, but are you claiming that you can do general wallet linking to fairly arbitrary outputs that may or may not be associated with an exchange providing you information? In the current version, no. Okay, I, I guess I'm just I'm just curious because earlier we talked about kind of the uh, the question about general uh, general transactions, and you talked about being able to link those to wallet addresses. So is that something you generally yeah. can do with? So this is I want to make sure I'm understanding. You said two so we, things here. Yeah. So we, we. So again, we have to discuss the concept of a wallet. So when we look at wallet addresses, there's wallets in Monero that you can you can definitely link to. Now we look at broader base, and this is I think the problem is that the term wallet is overloaded. Okay. Um, can you describe what you mean from by the it? old Bitcoin analysis? Well, become coming from the old bitcoin world the term wallet has multiple connotations so it can mean it can mean uh multiple addresses controlled by an individual it can mean um it can mean multiple addresses and multiple clusters of addresses that are linked together through other analysis that do not have necessarily a technical uh sp specific technical analysis but have a more 
um, looking at over time and clustering and looking at concentrations of funds analysis. It can look at IP address clustering analysis and determining that while all of these um, individual addresses and wallets appear to be different, they're all the same. So the problem is, is I think, a terminology one where wallet can mean two or three different things. Okay. So in the context of Monero, can you define what you mean by it? I'll defer to you to our for, to our next conversation around the technical side of things. So we have, yeah, we have different, you know, we're working on different terminologies of wallet and then clusters and users. Okay, but for the sake of this discussion, I should assume that you're probably referring to something more along the lines of clusters of one-time addresses controlled by a common key and not the wallet address that I would input into uh, my wallet software. Question mark. Yeah, that might be a, a topic for another call. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I think I that's just, a topic for another call. I, I didn't okay. realize we were going to go that deep in the technical side. but Okay, the, the, the only reason I asked is because uh, I had asked about wallet addresses and you said, yes, we can do that, which I thought, hmm, certain definitions would yeah, say we'll get you back can't to do what's that, a wallet. So. Hey, exactly, what's a wallet? Okay, I see. Um, okay, um, let's go on through some other questions that, uh, that we wrote down here. So has the tool mm -hmm. already been used for specific investigations? Yes. Okay. Um, so I, I just to, I guess there's two major ways that you would use a, a general tool like this. So it's one where it's like a, you're trying to target a specific user. It might be, let's use the example of someone who is a large drug seller on a dark net market. And you're trying to identify who this, this individual is. And then you have the other much more broad example where an exchange may just want to have a risk-based analysis. Um, which of these depictions is closer to what the the tool uh, what like is currently used for usually? It yeah, Justin, the tool is used for investigation purposes. We do not have an offering currently for exchanges to do risk based monitorings in the same way that we provide with other cryptocurrencies. So with other cryptocurrencies, we have a real time API that allows them to do a lookup of a address coming in or coming out or a transaction and be able to provide them a detailed risk score, looking at the transactional history in real time. Um, we do not have that available for Monero at this time. It is really designed right now, version one is to be able to provide financial investigators, whether at an exchange or in law enforcement, to be able to trace specific transactions and trace the money through it. Okay, and has this mostly been contained to investigate, investigators at the moment, or have you seen exchanges perform their own investigations too? Well, we've only announced the product uh, today on August 31st, 2020. Uh, so it, is all, it has been exclusively for financial investigators. Okay, understood. I was just, uh, I wasn't sure if you had worked in the past with uh, these VASPs yet, or if they are a, a new target customer well, of yours. Yeah, so we obviously have a lot of VASP customers. We have almost 200 VASPs as customers at CypherTrace. Uh, what we want to do is enable Monero to be not delisted from these things, you know, from these VASPs. So we've seen, unfortunately, over the last month, several VASPs um, delist Monero as a trading pair. We'd like to see that not happen. So we we believe that, you know, people should be able to make person-to-person -person transactions in a private fashion, but there's also law enforcement on the other side and regulators who are saying, you know, we, it, when it comes to the fiat bridge, we want to be able to understand if there's something that's bad or flagged in an investigation, we want to be able to get some tracing tools. So to date, our customers have been those law enforcement folks, but we anticipate over the coming six months, there will be quite a number of exchanges who would want to use this tool to be able to continue to support Monero as a uh, crypto to fiat trading pair. So um, I guess I hear from a lot of people in kind of the research space and also outside of the research space 
um, about the nature of chain analysis tools, since we do a lot of the same types of research ourselves kind of in-house publicly. Um, and one common argument I hear from these people, um, and I'm not saying whether I agree or disagree with these viewpoints, is that this is all some kind of compliance theater and that you know you can imagine that some entities could easily you know try to get you know honest transactions flagged or you know try to frame users by some probabilistic argument that is uh, behind some black box tool that isn't really made public um, i guess what's is there a counter argument to this is there validity to these arguments you know if not how do you avoid this Well, um, I'm a scientist and a, and a business person. I treat these arguments like the anti-vaxxer arguments, which is, you know, you can avoid science. Um, you can also avoid, you know, what's actually happening in the world. Nobody has time for searching people's transactions to look for weird, bad stuff. Um, nobody has budget to do it that I've ever experienced in the world. Maybe there's some weird shadow government agencies that we don't know about that are doing that, but it's just not been my experience. Is you know, my experience is people respond to complaints by people who got ripped off or who you know had some drug overdose or what have you because they bought fentanyl on a dark market, but mostly because people got you know, their funds stolen or an exchange got their funds stolen or, you know, North Korea hacked into an exchange and stole 500 million to fund weapons of mass destruction. That's all the stuff I see. So maybe there's some other thing, but that's not our experience in this world. There's just, those are all conspiracy theories and it's great for people to like them. I, I listen to them on comedy podcasts all the time. I mean, you have to take it as comedy at some point. Um, well, I guess I'm not referring to these so much as a that's conspiracy not or non-conspiracy, but more of as a data science problem, right? I mean, you're, you, you speak as though you'd like, uh, you know, ideally every exchange in the world to use your products to determine the risk level of transactions. But, you know, you've spoken of the fact that if I happen to have a benign transaction that, you know, may have associated with it, you know, some decoy history involving illicit transactions, that that increases my risk profile. Um, and if that increases my risk profile to the extent that an exchange won't do business with me, well, then I do have a problem. And that's not really a conspiracy theory. So this sounds like kind of more of a data science well, okay, problem that... for which the algorithms are not really known. Is that accurate or not? Or if not, why? Well, so I would, I, I agree with you on that, Sarang. So there's the reality and there's the there's the math. So behind it, our job is to reduce false positives, which is the problem you're referring to, which is I have a benign transaction and I got mixed in. You should not be flagged. So this is a big issue. The, the, there's two issues here, the false positive issue and the false negative issue. So the false negative issue is, of course, hey, I missed something and somebody, you know, transferred $50 million or $50,000 to a terrorist organization or to North Korea or some other sanctioned organization or child exploitation site or whatever it is. Um, so that's one issue. So you want to make sure that you've got the best view into what's happening, but you also have to manage the false negative issue or, or the false positive issue, which is that you don't want a deluge of all these small people that are getting flooded in that have nothing to do with anything bad. So the FP issue is almost as important, if not more important than the false negative issue, which is you can't have people being deluged with thousands of false traces every week that are just in innocent individuals. And this is the challenge. This is where Data science matters a lot, but it also gets into the back end issues of how do you manage these issues? How do you compare them against other financial transactions? So the, the temporal nature of somebody's transactions. So if somebody's done a thousand transactions and they all look good, and then you get one that looks a little bit dirty, but you've got a low probability, that needs to just get swept under the carpet. So this is the, this is how the the industry works. There's there's a lot of heuristical 
based modeling on the back end of these alerts. And our job is really to reduce false positives as much as it is to find the, the bad behavior. I guess, is there a way to reassure people that this is being done if the math isn't known and open? Sure. I mean, you have to look at the reputation of the people. We're having this podcast right now, the day that we've announced this this information. Sorry, I'm not the math guy on a lot of this stuff. Some of it we'll disclose, some of it we won't until, you know, the, the appropriate point. We're happy to work with, with the team on the Monero Research Labs and Justin and other advocates on Monero of what we can disclose. Well, you know, not this. even not even um, folks on the, on the side of the teams. Um, I just mean kind of in general, you know, whether it's to your clients or to people who might interact with these VASPs. You know, I guess if if the methods and math aren't open, if they don't know where the risk scores are necessarily coming from, I guess how do you properly reassure uh, these people oh, that that this is being done uh, in the way that you claim? Yeah. So the risk scoring stuff is a huge issue. So we disclose to our clients how the risk scoring algorithms work. You've really hit on a big issue, which is how do the risk scoring algorithms actually work? What is used in them? What is what is deterministic? What is heuristic? What is machine learning? How do you uh, com combine these things? Because if you, a lot of our customers are financial institutions. And as you look forward over the coming years, Cryptocurrency exchanges, hosted wallets, et cetera, are also financial institutions or so Bitcoin ATMs. And they fall under guidance around um, discrimination of providing credit. So, for example, AI algorithms are not allowed to uh, discriminate on providing credit for people without a human being looking at it. So these are the same types of things that we're subject to as well, which is how does your algorithm work? Is it machine determine, determined? What is the algorithm? How do we determine it from one to the other? What does a risk of four versus nine mean? What does 9.5 versus 10 mean? And these are all very, very highly scrutinized by our customers. Sarang, do you have any other questions? I think we've gone through at least most of them before we wrap up here. I have many questions, but I know, it sounds like I know. it should be deferred to another call with other folks. Um, okay, um, so I guess, Dave, what are your main goals for the tools over the, sorry, the Monero tool over the next year? So Justin, our main goals are to continue to prove accuracy. There's quite a number of, uh, of things that we've talked about that are, and, and on the roadmap for improving the accuracy to bring it past the 90% level. There's quite a bit of work to be done on clustering of disassociated wallets to bring those into focus to create entity clusters that use all off-chain analysis to do it. I think if you really look at the broader goals, we want to empower the law enforcement community to be able to chase down people who steal Monero, people who are using Monero to operate illicit businesses, but meanwhile, protecting customer privacy. And the, I'd say the other goal is let's not have Monero delisted from exchanges. If we're able to provide a more comprehensive risk score. And as Rank says, you know, looking at these different issues that we can provide a risk score which does not exclude people who innocently got in a mix from others who are habitually performing transactions that are high risk, then that's our goal because that helps Monero expand. Okay, Sarang, do you have anything else uh, for this call? Not for this call, I don't think. Okay. Uh, Dave, did you have any other comments that you would like to say to the Monero community? Yeah, thanks everyone for building an awesome product. I know some of you will agree with what we've done and some of you won't, but uh, I think we're out here to be open and as much as we can and discuss it. We look forward to working with the community on continuing to build a, a, a great privacy preserving technology. And thanks for your support. And I appreciate the people who don't like it either.
but thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you, Dave, for being on this call. It's good to have you as part of the discourse uh, on our end. That way we can you know, have a little bit extra insight into what you've been uh, working on. And I imagine that this will uh, become useful, uh, you know, or at least we hope we become, it becomes useful in terms of the other open research that is being done on uh, Monero as an, an open permissionless network. So we appreciate your uh, contributions and uh, we hope that uh, we can both work to make Monero better. Thanks for your time, Dave. Yep. Thank you. I will. Thanks, uh, Ryan. Really appreciate it. Yep. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.